So, modeling <coughs> late Iron Age regional transport networks in the southern Gauteng province of South Africa using least cost paths and network analysis. I will start with some background information because I don't think many of you will know the archaeology of this area. Um, around Johannesburg in South Africa, the Iron Age came to an end in the first half of the 19th <coughs> century AD and was followed almost immediately by the Industrial Age. Now, shortly before this radical change, which came with European colonial settlers, the late Iron Age populations of this area had developed proto-urban settlements, while earlier still the locals had lived in relatively small dispersed homesteads and followed a more pastorally oriented subsistence economy. Since 2008, uh, the Southern Gauteng Stonewalled Structures Project has been investigating the rise of pre-colonial proto-urbanism in a more than 8,000 square kilometer survey zone uh, between Johannesburg and the River Vaal. And within this survey area, around 7,000 stone walled ruins have been recorded using Google Earth satellite imagery. Uh, all of these ruins date to within the last 500 years. The stone walled ruins can be classified into chronological phases by their distinct architectural style. And in this study, we deal with three chronological snapshots, not the whole sequence, just three snapshots from the overall sequence. From the bottom, G1 is our label for the 15th and 16th centuries AD, mainly pastoral society that built relatively dispersed stone wall structures. Uh, G2 is a label we give to the late 18th and early 19th century AD phase when densely agglomerated stone wall structures represented a politically complex proto-urban Iron Age society. And finally, the colonial age snapshot is provided by an AD 1900 map of the study area that was produced by the British uh, Army Intelligence Division during the Anglo-Boer War. Iron Age homesteads in our study area, these are the stone wall structures, were composed of central stone walled enclosures for livestock and a surrounding outer stone wall, which defined the extent of the space occupied by the household, usually an extended family. The actual dwellings and storage structures, which in most cases consisted of mud-walled mud single-room buildings with thatched roofs, stood between the outer perimeter wall and the inner livestock enclosures. As the LIDAR image in the lower left shows, such stone walled homesteads occur in more or less densely packed clusters, and larger homesteads and clusters indicate larger, wealthier, and more politically powerful communities. Now, there is no record, recorded evidence for market economies or the significant movement of goods in the Iron Age of our study area. Uh, cattle herds, which were the store of social and political capital, would have been moved around for pasture and as spoils of war, and at harvest time, cereal grains would be transferred from family homesteads up the political chain of command uh, as tribute payment and to stock up the communal stores. Early European historical drawings show that oxen were sometimes used as riding animals um, and beasts of burden, but wheeled vehicles were not in use before the arrival of European settlers. And the only archaeological evidence for formal Iron Age roads that we have are short stretches of stone delineated paths to funnel livestock into and out of some of the homesteads. The first European settlers reached this landscape in the so-called trek boar migration of the 1830s, and they came in ox wagons, established farms and ranches, and soon thereafter the first colonial towns. By the 1880s, Johannesburg was a boom town of gold miners. Uh, British Army maps from AD 1900 at the height of the Anglo-Boer War show seven towns within our survey zone linked by a network of primary and secondary roads as well as a railway. And since we're about to deal with least cost paths, it's important to say something about the nature of this landscape. The study area is composed of rolling grasslands with more rugged terrain on some hills and in wooded river valleys. Uh, walking is easy all across this landscape, and aside from the perennial 
River Val, there are no major obstacles to movement on foot during the dry season. Uh, the soil is compact and easy to traverse, but in the wet season, swollen streams and rivers become more difficult to cross. So to move on to a discussion of methods and techniques, uh, for our analysis of the Iron Age networks, we group the individual stone wall structures, these homesteads, into clusters which can be considered as a settlement per se. Our clustering rules are based on proximity, and it is important to remember that they represent an etic view, an outsider's view. We don't think that the clusters are meaningless, however. They're often separated by streams and riverbeds, which suggests that our etic rules for defining clusters may have matched the emic definitions of communicators, communities in some cases. For modeling the least cost paths, we constructed two separate sets of all pair least cost paths and focal mobility networks. For the first set, shown in the top row, we used elevation data from an SRTM 90 meter digital elevation model. And to model the second set of least cost paths shown in the lower row, uh, we used only the terrain ruggedness index that we obtained from that same SRTM. Here we are interested in two research questions. First, what is the spatial relationship of the settlements to the main least cost paths in the three different phases? And second, is there a correlation between settlement rank and network centrality in the three different phases? And to answer the first question, we use the main least cost paths from our two focal mobility networks, uh, DEM and RUG for ruggedness terrain uh, index. These are defined as paths that were repeatedly chosen by the algorithm in constructing the focal mobility networks. We then used proximity as a simple measure of the spa uh, settlement spatial relationship to the main path. The results show that a high proportion of the colonial towns are located within one kilometer of main least cost paths in our study area. This is true um, regardless of whether one measures against the least cost paths derived from the elevation or the terrain ruggedness model. A considerably smaller proportion of the RNA settlements were located within one kilometer of these main least cost paths. Now to explain <clears throat> the reason for this close relationship, which is shown in the first two rows, we can also look at other spatial patterns. As indicated in the box numbers on this slide, 71.4% of the colonial towns are located within a kilometer of a major stream or riverbed, and all of them occur below an ele elevation of 1,600 meters above sea level. Uh, that's sort of the limit above which the rugged or the terrain gets really rugged, so they're in generally least, less rugged terrain. We can say that there was clearly a preference to situate colonial towns next to waterways and on low-lying, relatively flat terrain, among other things, European cultural preferences, real transport, and military strength, probably explain these settlement choices. The locations of Iron Age settlements, on the other hand, show a preference for higher elevations and more rugged terrain. As indicated by the box numbers in the second column, 70.8% of the G1 stone wall structures are located above 1,600 meters altitude, and 78.6% are in terrain classified as rugged. And again, among other factors, African cultural preferences, the lack of wheel transport, security requirements, and the unavailability of building stones in low-lying flat terrain all probably explain to varying degrees the Iron Age settlement location choices. Given the observed proxemics, we can provisionally conclude that our main least cost paths may be more relevant for studying transport in colonial times than in the Iron Age. Because the towns were situated for easy access, which is the basis on which least cost paths uh, are calculated within GIS. Are they relevant for studying the Iron Age sites? Iron Age settlements were generally located in elevated rugged terrain, seeming to avoid easy access. And here then, it's perhaps worth recalling uh, Van Lusen's statement in 2002 in his PhD, all of the GIS least cost imp implementation discussed here 
only make local decisions as to which neighboring cells uh, which cell has the highest or lowest value, they incorporate no global, and I might cultural, knowledge of the landscape at all. Our second research question asks if there is a correlation between settlement rank and network centrality. To rank settlements, we use two indices, demography and access to prime arable land. To measure the first, we counted the number of stone wall structures and measured their combined area within each of the clusters. For the colonial towns, in lieu of measuring the settlement size, we relied on the three-tiered ranking expressed by the type and size of the labels on the British Army maps of AD 1900. As a second measure of rank, we calculated the total area covered by prime arable soils within the 10 kilometer radius of each cluster's centroid. Spearman's rank correlation coefficient test showed no significant correlation between demography and access to prime arable lands, so they can be considered as independent indices. To study the correlations, we constructed several networks based on the least cost paths derived from the two terrain models, elevation and the ruggedness. For each of the three snapshot phases, we modeled the three nearest neighbor networks and the minimum spanning tree network using Kerskill's approach. Uh, because these two are quick to calculate and produce quite different networks, one could try other networks. For phase G1, the three nearest neighbors network produced three separate components as shown on the left. So we also tried the five nearest neighbors to obtain a single component network. And for the colonial phase, additionally, we modeled a network based on the AD 1900 roads, uh, the actual roads which connected the seven towns. <coughs> to calculate the, the centrality indices, we used a network analyzer embedded in the free software Cytoscape. And we focus here on three commonly used and often closely related centrality indices, uh, the betweenness centrality, which uh, has been mentioned before, the degree centrality, and closeness centrality indices. We applied Spearman's rank correlation coefficient test to all pairs of demographic and agricultural rank and to the network centrality indices. And Spearman's road, road generally showed very few significant correlations, but there are some exceptions and they're worth looking at. The exceptions in G1, our earliest phase, are, four, are that there are four significant correlations were found between the access to prime arable land and various network centrality indices. These are shown in the right-hand column in the red numbers. Curiously, one was a negative correlation and the others were positive. In other words, in three networks, the more prime arable land is accessible to a settlement, the higher its centrality index but in one network, the closeness centrality index is highest in settlements with the least access to the prime arable lands. Two further positive correlations are seen between demographic rank and the closeness centrality in the five nearest neighbor networks obtained for the elevation-based least cost pass, and these are shown in the first row, the red numbers there. In this network, the more centrally located settlements are the largest. It's difficult to see why Spearman's road detects significant positive correlation between G1 demographic rank and closeness centrality in the five nearest networks based on least cost paths. The positive correlations between G1 access to prime arable land shown in the center and the network centrality shown in the left column, uh, lower right map is a little easier to see while the negative correlation uh, between the central and the top right image is clearly visible. Um, as an interim conclusion, we can state that the choice of network has a large role uh, effect on the distribution of central locations. The network analysis results for G1 are a bit more confused than for G2 and the colonial phase, as we'll see just now, and this may also be influenced by the long time range of G1 uh, and the possibility that chronologically separate uh, networks, separate settlements, have been grouped into the same network. In G2, there are five significant correlations involving the three nearest neighbor networks obtained from the terrain ruggedness cost surface. They concern the closeness and betweenness centrality, both of which correlate negatively with the demographic rank of the settlements. And the correlations suggest that the larger the settlement, the less centrality it has in these networks. 
the closeness centrality index also correlates neg negatively with access to prime arable land. That is to say, the more prime arable land it has nearby, the less central is that settlement within the network. A visualization of the statistically significant negative correlations um, help us see the pattern of the largest settlements being located off the beaten paths, the largest dots in the top row, which show the most centrally placed settlements in the networks, are the smallest in terms of demographic size as shown in the lower row. The central image shows rank by access to prime arable land also shows a negative correlation with the network centrality maps in the top row. For the seven colonial towns, three correlations produced a high row value, but their p-value was higher than 0 0.05, so they're not within the bounds of what is usually considered statistically significant, but nevertheless, they're interesting because they show positive correlations between access to prime arable land and centrality in a minimum spanning tree network. Unlike in G2, the more access to prime arable land, the more centrally situated are the towns in this colonial network. A visual comparison between town rank in red and centrality indices uh, show the correlation quite well. Of note, however, is the edge effect, which prevents important but spatially marginal towns achieving high centrality values in this network. But deeper investigations are required for a better understanding of the significance of these correlations. But at first blush, we see some confidence, we see some confidence that, that least cost paths and network analysis can produce reliable results. We can show, for example, that there is fair similarity between the minimum spanning tree network obtained from the least cost paths between colonial towns and the actual colonial road network of AD 1900. But for the Iron Age, this exercise has shown clearly that the main settlements were located off the beaten track, perhaps for the purpose of added security and protection of livestock wealth. And in both G1 and G2, shown here as red dots, the largest settlements, that the largest clusters uh, with the most sites, are located in the central portion of the study area, where the highest hills provide good grazing and ample opportunity to keep livestock out of sight. Uh, beyond these observations, many questions remain for deeper reflection. For example, why is it that the majority of the network centrality indices do not correlate with settlement rank? Why do certain networks provide more correlations with settlement rank in a particular phase than they do in others? Why is it that certain centrality measures, such as degree, never correlate with Iron Age settlement ranking, while others, such as closeness centrality, seem to correlate quite often? Um, and one question that remains is, will modeling more networks add to the confusion or, in fact, clarify the matters? Thank you for your attention.